God, there is none like you. There never has been, there never will be. For your word tells us that when we trust you, when we entrust ourselves to you, we will find strength to face even the most difficult things. You know, Father, Paul reminded us that if we die with Jesus in a death like his, then we have the hope that we will rise with Jesus in a resurrection like his. And if we endure with him, we will reign with him. But God, if we disown you, your word reminds us that you will disown us. If we reject you, then how can you ever draw near to us? So God, this morning, give us strength. God, give us that strength day by day to trust you more and more. And remind us this morning, Father, that when we fall, you still remain faithful. Oh God, how great you are. Amen.
brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we have become servants of the gospel of Jesus Christ by the gift of God's grace that's given to us through the working out of God's power in our lives. And although you or I might be less than the least of all of God's people, this grace was given to us that we would preach the boundless riches of Christ and that we would make plain to everyone what Paul calls the administration of the mystery. That mystery which was for ages past kept hidden in God who created all things. You know, God's intent has always been that through the church, his manifold wisdom would be made known to rulers and authorities everywhere. And this continues what was begun then in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When we are found to be in Jesus, because of our faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. When we are found to be in Jesus, because we have believed him, we may freely come before the one and only great and almighty, creator of all things, and we need not hang our head in shame. When we are found to be in Jesus, because our faith lifts us up in righteousness, we could never deserve. We need not fear anything. Nothing in all creation can defeat us. So therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning I make this call to you. Do not be discouraged. Our sufferings, the, the trials we face, they are for our future glory. Paul says that's not because of any effort or high value of us. It's not because of our vain ambitions that they would save us. But rather it's because we have believed. Because we have believed, because we have confessed Jesus, we are saved. Paul continued and he prayed. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And we pray this, that you would know God's love that surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God.
it's so good to be in your house this morning. It is so good to bring you praise this morning. How great you are to us, God. Now, as we turn our hearts and our minds to the business of this church and to your word, we ask that you would give us the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, good morning. We don't always start worship without saying good morning first, but good morning, right? It's good to be here and be together in worship this morning. And wasn't it great to sing how great thou art this morning, right? It's, yeah, it's so good to be reminded of just how awesome our God is. Uh, I want to share just a few quick things with you that are happening in the life of our church. Um, as you can tell, lots of people on vacation, so... Please continue to pray for safe travel for everybody as they're traveling. Next week, it's going to be a skeleton crew up here because a lot of our team is uh, traveling. And so we just uh, pray for safe travels for everybody. Uh, coming up in August, we're going to have another outdoor worship opportunity. But this one's a little different. We're very excited about this service. Um, I know it's going to put like a cramp in some people's style. But we are, we are not going to have... an uh, a Sunday morning service on Sunday, August 15th. Instead of a Sunday morning service, we are going to have a Sunday evening service. And so we will meet outside for worship. Uh, and we're, we're kind of going old school here with like a tent revival kind of feeling. We're hoping that people will see the tent go up and, and things and come and join us for worship. And maybe the Lord will just do an amazing thing and move in the hearts of some people. Uh, that they might trust him for the first time. And so uh, Sunday evening, August 15th, 5.30 here at the church, we're going to be outside for worship uh, and following the service, because we're so well known for this, we're going to have ice cream treats for everybody, which will be great. And we'll have the bonfire lit if folks want to sit and have conversation around the bonfire. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful evening. And we are praying now, we hope you will too, that the Lord will give us just a beautiful, cool evening breeze, and it will just be a wonderful, wonderful time of worship. So we look forward to gathering together with you for that. Uh, just a reminder also, our midweek study, uh, we are working our way through the book of Revelation. We resumed this past uh, Thursday, and we meet every Thursday at noon. Um, if you're someone who is a, a worker, and you know, working during the day, if you have a way to log in on um, Zoom. You can log in on Zoom and maybe have an earbud in and listen while you're working. Um, we'd love to have you participate in that, in that study with us. Um, we are in Revelation chapter 6 for one more week. We've got to do the seventh seal, and then we'll be moving on to a few other things in, in Revelation. So we'd love to have you join you. Have you join us Thursdays at noon. Uh, Jeannie, are there any other pertinent things we need to get out there? Did I mess it up? Oh, 6 o'clock. My bad. All right. Thank you for catching that. Appreciate it. 6 o'clock for that service, not 530. These guys would have killed me. Uh, <laughs> so 6 o'clock for that outdoor service. All right. Uh, in your bulletins today, whether you're here in person or online in, with the virtual bulletin, uh, you'll find a prayer list in there. Uh, we ask that you would just uh, be praying for those things throughout this week. Uh, we, we believe and know that the Lord works through the prayers of his people, and so we ask that you join us in praying together for those things. And I would ask that you would just join me now in a time of prayer as we go before the Lord our God. Let's pray together. Well, Father God, again, thank you for this great and awesome opportunity we have to be together, to give you worship and praise this morning. Father, we thank you for the rain that you have sent to nourish the ground. And we know there are places, Father, where that rain has just been too much. And they're dealing with flooding. And uh, there are places where rain has not come. And they're dealing with drought. And so, Father, we pray for our land. We pray for the farmers who work this land to grow crops so that we have food. We pray that you would just be providing rain and nourishment for the ground. Father, for those who are struggling with floods, with tornadoes, with uh, earthquakes, with uh, the potential of tropical storms, uh, Father, we ask that you would just be uh, holding them all in the palm of your hand, protecting them. Uh, Lord, we continue to pray this morning for our nation. 
for unity within her. Father, we have come to this time where there is such great division in our country. And we ask and we continue to pray that you would render that, that you would draw us back to one another, that we would find commonality, and that you would unite us. President, for all of his administration, for Congress, Lord, we pray that you will just continue to help them govern wisely. And Lord, we pray that you would draw them to you, that as they govern, they would seek you. They would seek what is best for this nation. Father, we continue to pray for those who are traveling. We ask that you'll give them safe travel. Lord, we hear every day of, of accidents and other kinds of difficult things that are happening for people who are traveling. And we just pray, Lord, that you will keep these brothers and sisters far from those things. That you'll give them safe travel to their destination and safe travel home. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for the leadership of this church. And as our uh, leading, our, our, our governing body uh, gathers tomorrow for its monthly meeting, we ask that you would just... Uh, Give the, the council your wisdom and your strength and your discernment as they consider the things of this church. And Father, we pray especially for all those who are sick, for those who are in need of surgery, for those who are recovering from surgery. Father, we pray for those who are dealing with difficult relationships, family relationships, friendships, marriages, Father, we pray for all of those who are in great need, be it financial or some other kind of great need. Lord, we pray that you would show those needs to us and that you would make us able to meet those needs, to help our brothers and sisters. And so, Father, now as we turn our hearts to your word this morning, we ask again for the presence of of the Holy Spirit in this place, that we would rightly discern and rightly apply the word you have for us to our hearts and our minds and our lives. And so, Father, we ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. And the church said, Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to hear the word of the Lord this morning, I would ask that wherever you are, you would stand as we read God's word together this morning, giving God's word its full authority in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. This morning we read from Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. Paul writes, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to the reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ. Raised from the dead, descended from heaven, or descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain salvation, that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. For here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word to us. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, when I was a child, there was a sort of a popular phrase that folks would use when they were trying to suggest that an upcoming task would be physically demanding and one should come prepared to work, prepared for hard work. Actually, this phrase was really nothing more than free advertisement for a popular breakfast cereal. You remember when people said, you'd better eat your Wheaties. Right? You better eat your Wheaties. A while back, I said this to Ethan, my son, as we prepared for some strenuous activity. He sort of looked at me with this look of confusion. Admittedly, we don't have Wheaties in our house all that often. I asked him, do you even know what Wheaties are? I can't recall if he did or did not know what Wheaties were, but this one thing I know for sure. He certainly has not encountered the kind of robust marketing for Wheaties that the generations before him certainly did. When it comes to physical strength, more importantly, when it comes to determining how to increase one's physical strength, there is very little confusion on the matter. If you want to become stronger, you need a healthy diet, you need exercise and some kind of a plan to maintain that healthy body. So, eat your Wheaties, work hard, and you'll become stronger. But when it comes to finding an increase in spiritual strength, when it comes to growing in spiritual strength, there's often a lot more confusion. I mean, first of all, folks usually wonder, well, well what is exactly spiritual strength? And then secondly, they might ask, where can I get some of this spiritual strength? Finally, then I think folks would usually ask what they must do in order to become spiritually stronger. But the task of identifying and growing some strong spiritual muscles. It isn't just as simple as eating a healthy diet, exercising, and caring for oneself. Now, don't get me wrong. 
Each of those things is, I think, critically important if we intend to grow spiritually strong. For example, spiritual strength comes when we have a healthy diet of God's word. Each and every day we're reading the word, we're, we're ruminating on it, we're chewing on the word. We do find strength when we exercise those spiritual muscles. As we pray, we exercise our spiritual muscles. Uh, we exercise sometimes our preaching muscles, our giving muscles, all kinds of different spiritual muscles. But what good does it do any of us to know the importance of exercising these muscles, to seek after the strength that we might have for these muscles if we don't even realize that there is such a thing as spiritual strength. So today, rather than focusing on how we find more spiritual strength, how we grow spiritually stronger, I think at best we start with this question. How does one even find strength in the grace of Jesus anyway? How do we, how do we find it? What does it look like? What does it require? What must we do to even come to know the strength that is found in Jesus Christ? So I want to begin here today. When, when Jesus died on the cross, when he died for you and for me, he won something incredibly awesome for us. He paid off an incredible debt that we had racked up. Anybody here, by the way, ever ever pay off their mortgage? Anybody paid off their mortgage? Yeah. What does that freedom feel like, right? Yeah. What an amazing thing. He paid an incredible debt that we had racked up. He covered a multitude of sins for us, literally. What Jesus won that day is called grace. You see, grace is loosely defined this way. Everything that God gives us and he does for us, instead of giving to us or doing to us what we would really deserve. So when God gives us things that we don't deserve and he, and he does things for us that we don't deserve, instead of doing what we do deserve. In other words, grace happens when God gives to us that which we do not and cannot ever deserve. So if that's grace, then let's consider that opening question once more. How does one go about finding strength that this grace offers us? I think the Apostle Paul today gives us two powerful words to help us know better how to grow and exercise our grace muscles. How to grow in the strength that we find in Christ Jesus our Lord. The first of those powerful words he says, and trust. And trust. Second Timothy 2 and 2, he says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Some of you might say, you know, Pastor, that sounds a lot more like me growing my trust of other people rather than me growing in the grace that God has for me. And I would say true enough, but what if those two ideas are not mutually opposed to one another? What if our ability to pass on some of that God-given grace strength that we have is actually what causes our own grace strength to grow? Not just the person that we're giving it to, but us as well. Now this would probably be a good time to say, are you confused yet? Let me try to clarify. Perhaps what God's saying through Paul is this. Growing in the grace that I've given to you. Growing in the grace that I have given to you happens best when you share the grace that I've given to you with other people. Paul refers to that process here in his letter to Timothy as entrusting. What we have learned about God and about Christ Entrusting it through the power of the Holy Spirit to reliable people who will then be qualified to teach other people as well. That word, entrust, it actually means, when we look it up in the dictionary, it means to assign responsibility to. 
So maybe there are people here today who have a trust account with a bank, right? You assign the responsibility of that money to that bank. So what Paul is encouraging Timothy then is this. Do what you have seen other faithful men and women do. In particular, do what you've seen, and remember last week in chapter 1, do what you've seen your mother and your grandmother do, what you've seen me do. Well, what has Timothy seen these powerful role models do? Share Jesus. Preach the gospel. Love radically like God loves. In chapter 1 of this second letter to Timothy, Paul directed Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God. Remember that from last week? Fan into flame the gift of God. That gift is God's perfect word and his powerful spirit. In that same chapter we discussed last week, Paul also reminds Timothy of the love and the care, the support, and most importantly, the faith that he received from his mother, Eunice and his grandmother, Lois. Here's the thing. Whether it was Eunice or Lois or the Apostle Paul himself, the sharing of the faith is so much more than just simply telling Timothy about Jesus. When they shared their faith with him, they did so because they knew full well that faith in Jesus is a life or death matter. They didn't share faith with Timothy. He would die. So it makes sense then that near the end of the first chapter, the text we looked at last week, we hear Paul proclaim, this is why I'm suffering, Timothy. This is why I'm in chains. And this suffering brings no shame on me because I know whom it is that I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until the day when he makes all things new. So Eunice and Lois and Paul didn't just share the gospel of Jesus with Timothy. They entrusted it to him. They literally took it and put it in his hands and said, do something with it. They trusted Timothy not to let the good news of the gospel stop with him, but rather to so trust Jesus himself that he would desire to teach other people about Jesus. Perhaps one reason why when we look around this room this morning and we look at our churches in general around the United States, we see so few young people in our churches today. Maybe one reason is this. We haven't entrusted God's word to them. Perhaps, though we hope to have shared Jesus with them, instead what we've done is merely shown them something that we possess as our own. I wonder, have we strived to teach the next generation that Jesus is theirs too? Have we entrusted the gospel to them? And furthermore, have we burdened then that next generation with the responsibility of the gospel? Because after all, an an entrusting is a responsibility, to give somebody responsibility over something. So does the next generation know that they too then have a responsibility to preach and to teach that Jesus is ours? Two weeks ago, as our vacation came to a close, Sarah and I had the awesome opportunity to worship once again with a church family that is near and dear to our hearts. We worshiped together at Sovereign Grace Church in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, over the numerous times we have worshiped with this church, we've seen God doing this incredible thing, powerful thing. We have seen an amazing growth in this church. In fact, the last time we were there, just this past uh, month, there were more than 300 people gathered that day in a Marriott ballroom, by the way, because they're a transitional church. They're working towards building a church. More than half of which I'd wager to say were young couples, young families, and children. Now, I didn't just notice their age. I noticed many things about the people who were there and worshiped this morning, or that particular morning. But this one thing really struck me as I looked around. There was a deep, deep sense of responsibility 
with and for God's word in that place. Three elders of that church shared the word of God with us as part of the service. Now, each time they would each read a bit of scripture, they would expound upon it, they would share a little tiny morsel of their life, what God was doing with them, how he'd been working and moving and challenging them in their life. And, and as we watched the people around us, these young couples, these old folks, I mean, a wide gamut of folks, we noticed that all of them seemed just laser focused on what was being said. And, and many people were not even to the message yet, jotting down notes about what God was doing in someone else's life. These moments weren't the morning message. There was still more to come. But this was simply a moment where brothers and sisters were passing on the burden of the gospel to one another, to the next generation. The responsibility they have of teaching about how God and Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit are moving in their lives. You see, brothers and sisters, if God's word is never anything more than something which is read to us, then I fail to see how God's word can ever be anything more than something which someone else possesses. The only way we ever get God's word is by somebody reading it to us. They're reading it from their Bible. It belongs to them. Every night before bed when I was a child, my father would read a story to me. 99 out of 100 times, I asked to be read The Cat in the Hat. My father became so weary of that story he would beg and plead with me to pick something else. But time and time again, I wanted to hear the cat and the hat. And then they came out with the cat and the hat returns. <laughs> now, I could probably recite the cat and the hat for you this morning, at least most of it. But one thing did not happen as a part of all of the readings of that story. The cat and the hat never came to my house. He has not yet, nor do I think he ever will. <laughs> he has not come on a rainy day. He has not taken on human characteristics, making a complete mess of my parents' home, which my mother would be furious about. You see, we almost never read bedtime stories to our children to speak to them this express, express purpose that we're entrusting something to them so that they would live and accept and believe that story, that they would live it out in their lives, and most importantly, that they would pass on the responsibility of that story to other people. But when it comes to God's word, we should always entrust that word to everyone around us. First, so that others will have the chance to see faithful men and women with their own eyes. Faithful men and women who also have a burden for God's word and a desire to share that burden for God's word with them. And when it comes to God's word, we should always entrust that word to those around us so that they will become faithful models and examples of themselves. So the first powerful word is entrust. The second powerful word that Paul used with Timothy is join. Join. In this case, Paul is calling Timothy to join him in his suffering for the gospel. I spent most of my time today discussing the first word, entrust. So I'm going to keep my comments on this part brief, but we cannot pass by this word. You see, to suffer means something different to each and every person, and it means something different in every situation in which we encounter suffering. But here, in this situation, Paul means suffer with me, experience it with me, uh, participate in it with me. Earlier, I used the word burden. Several times we discussed the need for entrusting God's word. That good deposit, 
to those who come behind us. To, to suffer means, why are we entrusting God's word to our children, to our grandchildren, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our family? Why are we doing it? And why are we calling it a burden? Why are we using this suffer? Simply because of this. Trusting Jesus is not always easy. Amen? Wait a second. You guys must have had a different life than I did. <laughs> Trusting Jesus is not always easy. Amen? Amen. Okay. <laughs> Trusting God to move and to work for you is hard, but the, that path of righteousness, you know, it's filled with bumps, potholes, and thickets and thorns and rocks. I once saw a bumper sticker that said, life is rough, then we die. Life is rough, then we die. I thought, what a terribly depressing outlook on life. I mean, surely there's more to life than just rough times and death. But then I take a step back and I realize this. Anything that we encounter in this life that is neither a rough time nor death, it has to fall into one of two categories. If it's not a rough time or death, guess what it is? Grace or mercy. So life is filled with grace, mercy, rough times, and death. Oh, and if you have Jesus, life. I think this is why Paul stresses here in chapter 2 the growing in the strength of the grace that we find in Christ Jesus. Because life is tough. The road is hard. And we need some strength for that journey. So Paul writes in verses 4 through 6 of our text today, no one Serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Amen. You see, we find grace strength in Jesus when we obey God like a soldier. One cannot be considered a soldier under the command of an officer of the army and at the same time disobey the commanding officer. Above all things, soldiers obey the commands that they are given. So we find great strength when we obey God. We find great strength in Jesus when we abide with God. It's interesting. You know that hymn, Abide With Me? That's all about us asking God to abide with us, right? Right? I'm suggesting to you we get strength when we abide with him. What I mean here is this. Athletes just don't quit. They don't just give up when the going gets tough. When the team is losing by 10 points and there's only two minutes left on the clock, the true athletes dig deeper. They don't quit. By the way, funny enough, that's when most athletes will tell you they feel they're at their strongest They've got the most energy and endurance is in those last two minutes. Dig deep, stick with it, bring home the victory, abide with God. So we find insurmountable grace when we obey God and we abide with God. And that grace then in turn gives us strength and power. We have this incredible grace strength. Then we are blessed and we'll have this rewarding opportunity that Paul calls harvesting like a farmer. Sometimes, you know, farmers go to their fields every morning and every morning they see very little change. Almost new, no new growth. But still, every single day they go to their fields and they tend to those fields and they care for those fields and then all of a sudden one day there's fruit. There's full-grown plants. The fruit is ready for harvest. But that harvest didn't come without daily, fervent, consistent care. So I want to close this morning by trying to sum it all up into what I call a big-picture point for you today. 
You see, Paul writes, if we die with Jesus, we rise with Jesus. If we endure with Jesus, we reign with Jesus. If we disown Jesus, though, he disowns us. But you know, when life gets tough and we turn our backs, we fall down, Jesus doesn't fall. Jesus remains faithful. That's the key. That's the big point. That's why Paul opened this chapter by calling Timothy to find the strength that is found in Jesus Christ to entrust that grace strength to others so that they too might pass it on. And we would all know the burden of Jesus' grace. In verse 7, Paul asked Timothy to take a moment and reflect on this. He says, remember Jesus, raised from the dead, descended from David. Endure with him, suffer for him, find strength day by day as you trust him more and more. And you experience his grace over and over and over again. Listen, folks, we are walking one heck of a bumpy road, are we not? We are the ones who oftentimes give up so easy. God doesn't give up. He doesn't care how big the bump is, how big the pothole is. Keep going, he says. When we fall, Jesus remains faithful. There's no greater, more encouraging thing I can tell you this morning about building up your grace strength muscles than that. When we fall, Jesus is faithful. And that's when we find the grace. That's when our muscles grow. That's the true source of strength of the grace of Jesus Christ. When we fall, he picks us back up. When we fall, the truest source of energy and strength is right there for us. I would pray for you all that you know the grace strength of Jesus. That you would exercise those grace strength muscles by sharing that grace strength with other people. Let's pray together. Father, what a great and awesome truth it is that If we die with you, we rise with you. If we endure with you, we reign with you. When we fall, you pick us up. Lord, there is no greater truth in all the world. There is no greater gift that could ever be given than what you have given us in the grace, strength, of Jesus Christ. So help us, Father, to work those muscles every single day. Help us to have a healthy diet of your word. Help us to chew on it and ruminate on it. Help us, Father, to strengthen those muscles, those prayer muscles, those preaching muscles, those teaching muscles, those sharing and giving muscles. And Father, When the road gets bumpy and tough and we fall and you lift us right back up, may we be reminded that we're lifted by the grace strength of Jesus. For Father, there is nothing else. There is nothing more. Lord, your grace is enough for us. Amen. So as we prepare to sing our final song this morning, I have to share a quick little story. I didn't tell Joe about this, but a few weeks back, um, someone was leaving church and they said to me, hey, we need to sing something that really wakes us up, you know, really gets us moving. So that's what we're about to do, all right? We're going to stand. We're going to sing together. Kristen's going to dance a little bit because she, she always does when we sing this song. So stand and sing with us and let's give praise to God. You live.
just encourage you to entrust the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is, this is big, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Entrust it to your children, your neighbors, that they can trust him too. That they would too have the burden of Jesus. And as you go to trust him, would you go then with the love of God our Father, and the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. for joining us this week. Have a wonderful and blessed week. We'll see you next week.